Hello, my name is Wildstag, and thank you for tuning in to another used book rant. Today I'm going to be covering this book, The Ascent of Rum Doodle, by W. E. Bowman. This book, like Brown, The Last Discovery of America, I bought in December of 2021. Specifically, I bought The Ascent of Rum Doodle at La Playa Books in San Diego. I had seen it or heard about it beforehand, so I roughly knew that it was kinda outdoorsy, and I knew it was a comedy, but I wasn't prepared for the content in here and how goofy it is, while at the same time, how important it is to the uh, field that it mocks. So right off the bat, the, the praise on the front cover, as you saw a second ago if you paused, reads, One of the funniest books you will ever read from the introduction by Bill Bryson. I've mentioned Bill Bryson before, and on the bookshelf behind me is one of his books, The Lost Continent, and he's a really funny author. Not really outdoorsy so much as travel-related, I guess, but he's a, he's a fun journalist to read. The inside cover goes on to say, W. E. Bowman was born in 1912 and died in 1985, was a civil engineer who spent his free time hill walking, painting, and writing unpublished books on the theory of relativity. He was married with two children. So that's the kind of guy he was. Kind of funnily enough, Bill Bryson after he read this, and he explains it in the introduction, which is itself a long-form review. He, uh, he read this and thought it was, like, a pivotal British humor. That, like, it was one of those comedy books that everyone from the United Kingdoms, they would have to know it. It's a perfect, shining example of their humor. And then it turns out he gets there and no one knows it. He doesn't actually find anyone that knows about this book. And I'm gonna continue a bit. The introduction covers Bill Bryson's search for the author of this book until finally after talking on a radio show in London he received a cheerful and kindly note written in elegant hand from Ava Bowman, the widow of the author. And from there, he gets to know the, the widow and learn more about the, uh, the author and his mindset in writing this book. And I think as a good way to start my own thoughts of this rant, I'm going to read one of the paragraphs from the end of Bill Bryson's introduction. In 1981, almost exactly a quarter of a century after Rumdoodle's publication, Bowman discovered to his surprise that in the late 1950s, members of the Australian Antarctic Expedition had affectionately attached names from this book to certain geographical features, and that some of these had been incorporated into Antarctic maps. Since 1966, Mount Rumdoodle, population 153, elevation 153, has been an official designation. Bowman learned of this only because he happened upon a game called The Great Rum Doodle Puzzle, which had been produced by a member of one of the early expeditions. At the same time, a 250-seat restaurant named Rum Doodle opened in Kathmandu and is still going strong. The ascent of Rum Doodle in Bowman's lifetime was underappreciated by the public but, as Bryson points out, the audience that this book makes fun of, the mountaineering, the exploring, the, the high-altitude explorers, the, you know, mountaineers, uh, people that, you know, ice climb, that kind of thing, that's the community this teases. But they love the book, and it turns out, I guess, that despite it being, like, a snowballing story where every mistake builds upon mistake after mistake after mistake and each one is just joke upon joke about bad people uh, you know people doing their jobs poorly in the field 
the audience that this teases loved it. The copy I have here comes with uh, photographs and uh, pictures, I guess uh, prints, I guess they're, they're called, of the group as they go about their expedition. But I'm getting ahead of myself. The first chapter of this book is simply titled, The Team. And the description of this is that Rum Doodle is, instead of Mount Everest, Rum Doodle is the highest mountain peak in the world. And this expedition and the following team are the white European Anglo-Saxon explorers whose names are going to be tied to the ascent of the summit. And it does comment on that pretty humorously. This book knows who to make fun of. That's the simplest way to put it. And I love it so much. So the team first was Tom Burley, a major in the RASC, in charge of the commissariat, well known for his prodigious feats of endurance on many mountains and chosen as our strongman, had been high, interrupted a mountaineering furlough in the Alps to join us. Christopher Wish, scientist to the expedition, excellent on rock, had been higher than most, just returned from a successful first ascent in the Andes. Donald Shute, our photographer, splendid on ice, had been as high as most, lately returned from the Rockies. Humphrey Jungle, radio expert and route finder, had been nearly as high as most, recalled from the Caucasus. Lancelot Constant, diplomat and linguist, in charge of the porters, chosen especially for his social tact and good fellowship, was expected to go high, just back from the Atlas Mountains. Ridley Prone, doctor to the expedition and our oxygen expert, had been high enough, barely returned from the Himalayas. Right off the bat, I'm going to read a bit further from this book. I don't want to do too much because it's only... The story is only 171 pages, but every page has a joke. It doesn't drag on. It doesn't become a slog, despite the events of the story becoming a slog for the characters. It is always building upon joke upon joke upon joke, and it's masterfully written in that regard. But I'm going to read the first couple pages of chapter two because it expands upon a comment I made a few minutes ago about the Anglo-Saxon explorers, whereas they had to have help, and how it comments on that white man explorer archetype, that trope. The object of the expedition was to place two men on the summit of Rum Doodle. This necessitated the establishment of a camp at 39,000 feet stocked with a fortnight's supplies for two, so that in the event of adverse weather conditions the party could wait in comfort for an improvement. The equipment for this camp had to be carried from the railhead at Chaikosi, a distance of 500 miles. Five porters would be needed for this. Two porters would be needed to carry the food for these five, and another would carry the food for these two. His food would be carried by a boy. The boy would carry his own food. The first supporting party would be established at 38,000 feet, also with a fortnight supplies, which necessitated another eight porters and a boy. In all, to transport tents and equipment, food, radio, scientific and photographic gear, personal effects, and so on, 3,000 porters and 375 boys would be required. The city of Chaikosi, where they need to pick up those 30,000 porters and 375 boys, the town is in the fictional country of Yogistan, where the people speak with a system of belches and burps that it's not intended to be critical of Sherpas and the culture around them and the translation barriers between them, but rather it's making fun of the way English accounts describe those explorations of Mount Everest, of K2, and of uh, a bunch of other books. Rumdoodle, this mountain, is 40,000 and one half feet tall, 
which is shockingly higher than Mount Everest. And that hyperbolic height is kind of the point. At each thousand feet of elevation, there's a new camp. And at new, each new camp, they need all those porters, all those boys to carry each set of gear. And all these different bizarre circumstances happen where the route finder ends up getting lost on the way to the meeting in England and ends up 20 miles in the wrong direction. And then he doesn't have the right currency, so he sends for money and they give him money. But then he ends up 40 miles in the other direction and he keeps on ending up at every destination that isn't the group of explorers. And eventually when he does find them, he's broke, he's made them broke, and he still leads them down the wrong paths. Like, every character is just a cascade of failure in the funniest way possible. And when it comes to the end, the you, you see the hardship, but it ends with like a deus ex machina in a characteristically funny way which I'm no, not going to ruin for you here. This book kept me laughing for days. I, it took me about a week to read this just from cover to cover because I was reading it in between gaps at work. I could not stop laughing at this book. I paid six and a half dollars for it at La Playa Books in San Diego and I have my money's worth well spent. And I'm going to read it again and again and again and again. It is funny every time I read it. I will say there is one complaint I had about it though, and that is, in the US you never hear the word rarefied, which is to say high altitude air, that thin air you get at elevation. I've worked around the Rocky Mountains for several years now and I've never heard anyone mention rarefied at all. They'll say like altitude sickness or something like that. Maybe I read it once in a Knowles guidebook on wilderness medicine, but in The Ascent of Rum Doodle, and then later a book I read recently, A Lady's Life in the Rocky Mountains, I think is what it's called. Um, she, another uh, English writer, uses the word rarefied often, and um, I, I have never heard the word rarefied used in speech, and I definitely had not seen it used in print so often until this year. So two books completely ruined that word for me, but it's such a minor complaint about the book as a whole, you're going to love it regardless. I think if you want a good parody read, especially one about outdoorsy uh, shenanigans, this is the book for you. My name is Wildstag, and thank you for tuning in to another used book rant.